All right, turn to John chapter 8. And I have a bit of a dilemma today because a passage is before us that I actually don't think is in Scripture. So I'm going to jump over that passage, but if anyone wants to discuss it briefly or why I'm jumping over it, then let's do that. The, the passage in question is the passage that the woman who is caught in adultery, it's called the uh, pericope uh, adultery, yeah, uh, which just means the passage about the, uh, the adulteress. Um, does anyone want to discuss why we're jumping over it or the passage itself in any way? This is the most popular probably passage uh, that I can think of about Jesus that everybody knows about, and it's likely not original. It's, it's definitely not original to John. Um, it may or may not be an original story that actually is something that happened from Christ, but there's really no way of knowing if it's an actual story that's from Christ or not. Where did it come from? So it would be like a Dead Sea Scroll? Uh, no, what happens is the, the story begins to appear in the Church Fathers early on. Um, it's not in the original manuscripts at all of anything. Later on, it starts to appear in the manuscripts, but with like, you know, often there's like an asterisk uh, next to it that the scribes has put, all, almost to say either don't read it in church or, um, or maybe that it's not original. We're not quite sure why they're putting it there, but they're noting it for some reason. Um, eventually, it gets kind of put into the text, but it's put into different places, different places in John, and then it also appears like at the end of Luke. Um, almost like this, it's a, 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 a floating story and they don't know where to put it. Um, it is not Johannine in its language. Uh, as you can see, as we'll see today, basically it, it just kind of interrupts the narrative. It has nothing to do with what Christ is talking about. It has nothing to do with the theology of John. It makes no sense. The language is more the language of Luke, if anything, but it's not really uh, the language of John at all. And like I said, the earliest manuscripts don't have it. And so it's, just, it's an irony that so many people appeal to this story when it's probably not original. However, having said that, let's say that we accidentally took it as original. Does this story teach anything that the rest of the Bible like, doesn't teach? You're like, I don't even know what the story is about. Well, she should be killed. <laughs> The Bible does teach that that is the consequences that she should be, well, they both should be. Right, but she can be forgiven by whom? Well, I also thought it was. Well, ultimately, though, by whom? I also thought the story itself expresses the wisdom because instead of like answering them, um, yes, sir, you know, we're going to stone her or not, he mm. just bent down and he's like, so why is it? He's like, which one of you cast first, you know, yeah. without sin, which seems to be, it fits with the character of God. It very much fits with the character of God, I think. You're right. And I think, I think it's consistent with the Bible in terms of God is forgiving. It's consistent with, we know that Jesus can forgive sins, um, and therefore, because he's God. Um, it's consistent with, he condemns her sin. But he doesn't condemn her. He just tells her basically to repent, sin no more. Um, so it's not really teaching anything that's out of bounds. But it, because of that, you could actually take it or leave it, and you'll still get the same theology either way. The only thing that it may, and this, this would be only if you don't have it in the context of the rest of the Bible, you may think that she's forgiven when she doesn't repent, because there's nothing about her repenting here. However, the context of it seems to indicate she's about to be stoned to death. Ah, maybe she's regretting her, her decision. Um, and that there actually would be repentance there for Christ to say, you know, I don't condemn you and whatnot. There's a variety of places that have implied repentance. Right. Or implied faith. Right. This yeah. is just one of them. Actually. Right. So if you're under elders who take this to be authentic yeah. in, a, in a church and yeah. preach it, authoritatively. Yeah, you're totally fine. You're fine. Because it's, uh, it's the same thing. And, and, and this passage has been in the King James Bible before. Right. The, the Puritans preached it as authority and, yeah. and so on and so forth for 300 years. 
Well, and, and the interesting thing is, and this is this is important. This is a good text to kind of go off of. This is important. If I were to take all of the opposite textual variants from everywhere in Scripture and make a Bible out of that, and then take all the variants that are opposite of that and make a Bible out of that, guess what? I'd, I'd have the exact same theology and ethics out of both Bibles. It's the same religion. You would not be getting anything different. You might be getting something different in this place than you have in this place, but you wouldn't be getting any different theology. You wouldn't be getting any different ethics. You'd be get, getting the exact same thing, which is why it's, it's not that God has necessarily preserved uh, the Bible by not having any textual variants. He's actually preserved it through text, textual variants, regardless of what they are, because it's all the same theology and ethics and redemptive story and gospel and all of that. Um, and so people act like, oh, no, you could have a different Bible. And it's kind of like, well, not really. Uh, if you're talking about, you know, what it says specifically in a particular verse, yes. If you're talking about different theology and ethics, no. Yeah. So in the light of what you have said, um, would you say this is an inspired text uh, and should, be in, sh should it be in canonized? So how would you connect the inspiration and the canonicity of this particular text? You know, in this, uh... I would say I don't know if it's inspired. I would say that it's true. So I would say that this is true, and it corresponds. And the reason why I would say this is because I'd be judging with other scripture that I do know is actual scripture, um, and it accords with it. So I would say, well, it's true, but not all that's true is inspired and belongs in scripture. And so I would just say, for me, I would be like, I don't think it belongs in scripture. But I don't mind if someone else has it because, look, there are canon lists that have whole books that we wouldn't agree with. But when you read those whole books, it's the same theology. Like if you read like Clement, has anybody ever read Clement? You read Clement, it's, it's basically Paul. <laughs> I mean, it's not, I mean, it's not much different or whatever. Or the Epistle of Barnabas, or you read like the Didache or something. It's not really different. You're not getting a different religion. Um, and so it really doesn't matter in that regard. It really just matters that we do know most of the scripture of what it is. And I think, I think we know all the scripture really. Um, but we can judge those things as they're true or not by the scripture. And incidentally, that's going to be the message that we're going to be talking about a little bit today as we go through the actual passage, um, uh, in chapter eight. I've heard a distinction between something that is inspired and then something that is canonical, canonical. Uh, so there can be something represented in the text, like gotcha. actual variants that, yeah. that are solved, that are locked in, yeah. but they're not necessarily considered to be inspired. Have you, have, have you done any thought on that distinction? I guess I would say that all those variants are inspired as well in the sense that they communicate, they communicate the inspired truth. Um, you can make the distinction as to whether or not, like, that's what God had them originally write with the, the, uh, the variant. And maybe that's the distinction people are trying to make, that, that this isn't the original writing. But if I take, you know, God is love, and I say God is charity, I've said the exact same thing. Maybe the original thing said, you know, actually the original thing we know is, uh, you know, agape hatheos. Um... But all of those are the inspired truth of God, but the text was, you know, agape patheos. Um, and so I would just say, yeah, so may maybe that's the distinction they're making with uh, there are things that are canonical, they convey the inspired truth, but maybe they're not the original. Or like uh, this is represented so well and so and right. in a lot of manuscripts, but not the oldest manuscript. Yeah. It is in every Bible that we have. There yeah. would be a publisher that wouldn't publish it uh, without it. Yeah. So in that way, it's like it's a part of the canon of Scripture, right. but not necessarily inspired Scripture. Yeah. It is included, but not inspired. Kind of like well, Drake was brought on about canonization. There's like the three and types of canonization. It is true. just fit all into that third yeah. category. Yeah, well, that's why all your English Bibles have like notes below, right? It's like some manuscripts read this. Yeah. Um, but again, is, is anything a different theology or different religion? Are you getting like uninspired truth there? It's like, no, you're, it's, it's the same truth. Yeah. 
Um, again, it just depends on where you're reading it in the scripture. So any questions on that? I, I hope that's understood. Uh, the reason why I say that is because you should have absolute confidence that you have the word of God. I mean, this is the, the best um, attested book, I think, in all of history. Um, I think the next one to it is like Homer. I think Homer, I think we have like 800 something manuscripts of Homer. You know how many manuscripts there are of the Bible? The Greek manuscripts are around 5,000. If you include the other languages, it's almost 25,000 manuscripts. And yet, they all teach the same religion. They might have variants in how they say it, but it all teaches the same thing, which I, I think that's amazing. 25,000, and they all teach the same thing. I heard uh, so that book, Dominion, of, that I've been reading. Mm -hmm. uh, it talks about how throughout Persian and Roman history, the, the cross is the symbol of death and humiliation and all sorts mm -hmm. of things. But of all of the accounts of men being hung and humiliated, there are only four accounts of the man on the tree living. And all four of those, and this is a secular historian, um, and all four of those uh, are the Gospels. Mm, interesting. And all scholars agree, like unequivocally agree, that it's a fact in history that that happened, and that uh, and that that the problem that they had was that the man that was on the cross rose to deity the way that their kings who become deity would rise to deity and it's the ultimate reversal it's the ultimate yes yeah, in the roman empire in the roman yeah. empire yeah it's the antithesis of what a god is yeah um but i was just trying to add to that well yeah i mean in the same way it, it, people would think well god god sh and this is bart Ehrman's shtick if you've ever listened to bart Ehrman, who's uh, an apostate um He's like, well, if God, if this was God's word, he would have preserved every single word in the exact way, same way that he, he spoke it. It's like, no, he doesn't even do that from the Old Testament to the New. And Jesus is fine with quoting something and paraphrasing something and all of that. That's no problem. Um, if God, so what did God actually do? What would he, he would, he would actually preserve the truth. And he maybe even preserve it in different ways, uh, saying it in different ways so that it would be preserved in every culture, not just in one or something. So, yeah, no, an amazing thing. But I am going to then jump over this text because it really does have nothing to do with John and the argument that Christ is making to the Jews. I love it. That was you jumping over it for 15 minutes. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. Well, yeah, I could have gone all day on that. Um, all right, so what we are going to read is starting in verse 12. And I'm going to read or have you guys read maybe down to... Uh, verse uh, 33. No, sorry, 32. So anyone want to read? 20, 20 verses. Sophie, you want to read? <laughs> Where are we? What are we doing? I would love to. We're doing Shakespeare tonight? I don't want to make her read the whole thing. It's actually a lot to read. She's, she's, she's straight yeah, good. All right. All right, 12 through 32. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, You are bearing witnesses about, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, Father, if you knew me, you would know my father also. 
These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die, and you will die in your sin. Where where I am going, you cannot come. So so the Jews said, Will he kill himself? Since he says where I'm, where I am going, you cannot come. He said to them, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, Who are you? Jesus said to them, Just wait. Just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge. But he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have looked at the Son of Man, then you will know that I am that, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, maybe many believed in him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Okay, if you abide in my word there you go that that's really important <laughs> to the to what the passage is about um thank you so much very good um so uh turning on your brains i know you guys have probably, probably had a long day at work and all that sort of thing but uh what do you think this passage is about <laughs> Simple and fast. Seems <laughs> like. <laughs> what? What'd you say? Jesus. Yeah, exactly. There you go. They, they judge according to their standards, and Christ is saying, "I'm not judging anyone. God is judging you through me." And so, it seems like uh, what he's talking about is they're condemning him and judging him, and yet he's saying, actually. God is judging you through me. Yeah. Is that where you're getting from? Yes, that, that's, that's the core of it. Um, well, there's, there's, there's a little bit more, but that's the core, I think. So, Can I ask Yeah, go ahead. Last week, where you taught that the world cannot hate you, but it hates me, and then you go on to read this, and it almost seems as though now we're, uh, he's starting to show us Mm-hmm. The world hating him, right? And that they hate him because they are not God's children, but they're children of. So it almost seems to me that he's speaking what he said back here, and now he's showing it to everybody who's standing. There. Yes. So um, I'm glad you brought that up. So what did, what did we talk about last week? Sherry just mentioned it that uh, the world hates Jesus. Why? Because he, he condemns their them sin. They're sinners. Yeah, he tells them that their their deeds are evil, right? Yeah. So they don't they don't like it. They don't want to hear that. So now what you have is you have this whole section where he has this conversation with them and he's telling them that he's getting his truth from where? From himself? From his father. What an amazing thing for God the Son to say I'm not speaking from myself. Now, he does say to them, because they accuse him, like, well, you're, you're testifying yourself, and they're appealing to the law, right? You need two or three witnesses to testify. And he's like, even if I only had me, my testimony is still true. Why? Because he's God. But notice what he says. But it's the Father who testifies of me. I'm actually speaking the words of the Father. Jesus, God the Son, is not going to speak his own opinions as a human. He's actually going to get what he says from the Father. More evidence of the Trinity, then. So he actually is bringing three witnesses and three testimonies. Well, right, but he's trying to communicate to them that the one they say they worship is actually the one who is the source of his truth. Um, So he starts out by saying, look, I'm the light of life. What is light in John? Yeah, truth. It's it, what is light though. Let's actually just ask the yeah. Let's ask that question, the generic question. What is light? 
exposes signs. Yeah, it's the sphere in which you are that allows you to see everything else, right? If you are in darkness, you are easily deceived by someone saying, oh, well, that's this, and that's that, and that's the other thing. And you can just be tricked because you can't see it. Light allows you to see what it is. So if someone comes along and says, oh, I think it's this, you're looking at it, and you're like, no, 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 that's not what it is. I can see it. Christ is saying he is that light. He is that truth. And the truth by which you should see everything else is what he got from the Father. It's not something he got from his tradition. It's not something he got from philosophy. It's not something he got from uh, contemplating his navel in some sort of mystical experience. It's not what he got from his personal opinion and reasoning. And if Jesus, the Son of God, did not get his truth from his own reasoning, then who are you to do it? If God comes to you with his truth and say, yeah, but I think, well, I just think the last thing out of your mouth when someone brings to you the word of God should be, yeah, but I just think. To me, though, Brian, this passage means. <laughs> right. Well, I, you, know, you know, my truth, I'm just living my truth. And it's like, no, no, no. Jesus doesn't live out his truth. He's living out the father's truth. Because that's actually the truth. And so his claim against these religious people who think they're worshiping God, again, these are not the pagan Romans. This is the church before the church. And the church before the church is getting its opinions, Christ is going to say, according to, and he says two things. One in seven, he says, according to uh, the Greek word opsin, uh, from uh and so it actually means to see from sight. And sight in John means experience. They're getting their ideas from their experience. And then he describes it again in accordance with the sarks, the flesh. So in other words, they're getting their truth, their ideas from their experience and their own personal reasoning, their own culture, their own religious culture, and their own tradition. And what I want to convey to you is that to believe in Jesus is to believe in what? Mystical experiences, tradition, culture, your own personal reasoning. What, what does the Bible say? Trust in the Lord with all your what? Heart, 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 mind, soul, and strength. Almost, Titus. Good job. You actually added there to the word of God. I'm going to have to stone you later. Well, hey, they did it for John, so it still was true to the... Touche. All right. It's practically fire. Um, and for the billionth time, what does heart mean? Trust in the Lord with all your feelings when you have, you know, emotional trouble. Right. So trust in the Lord with all your mind, meaning trust in the Lord with all your reasoning. Don't lean. That's the second part. Don't lean on your own understanding. So to follow Jesus, if Jesus, as we talked about at the beginning of John, He's the word of God, right? What does that mean? That it means the whole of scripture is Christ. It's not something different than him. It's him. So to believe in Jesus and to follow Jesus means you submit your ideas to what? Jesus, the word. Which is ultimately what? Do you have Jesus in front of you? Right, to scripture. I don't see how you get Anything else, let's forget traditions of, well, the Eastern Orthodox say, well, the Roman Catholics say, forget all that. Forget Anglicanism and all that other stuff. I don't see how you get anything else but sola scriptura out of what Jesus is saying here. And not just as some sort of like, well, we just decided to do sola scriptura. What does he say of the people who don't do it? Yeah, he's like, I mean, we didn't read it. That's next time. But he's going to say, you're the, children, you're, you're the children of the devil. And what you believe by your own reasoning are lies, and it's murderous. And you're murderers like your, your father is. 
That's really important. If you get your own ideas, you are a liar. You are lying to yourself. You are lying to other people. And through those lies, that's actually how we murder people. Um, Paul, when he explains who we are apart from Christ in Romans 3, what does he say? He says, there's no good person at all, right? But do you remember the imagery that he gives at, at, toward the end? The poison of asps is on what? Your lips. Your, your mouth is what? Anybody remember? An open grave. So what Paul is actually saying, and he uses the word worthless, that's terminology you use of a murderer in the Old Testament. We are destroyers of others because we are getting our opinions from our own reasoning, from our own traditions, and from philosophies of the world that are of the flesh, and not from the word of God. And then we speak those things and we kill everyone around us. So Christ's point is this, I'm the son of God. I am the I am he. He says it twice here. By the way, they don't pick up on it until the end of the chapter. And then when they finally get what he's saying, he's like, they try to kill him. Um, he, they don't pick up on it yet. He said it to him twice now. Uh, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Uh, when you lift up the son of man, you will finally see that I am he. He says it again. Of course, at the end, it's going to be before Abraham was, I am he or I am. And that's when they pick up stones to stone him. But he is the great I am. He is the great I am he. He is the God in Isaiah, the God of the Exodus. And he's saying, I'm not going to form my own opinions. He actually says, I don't judge anyone. Now, does Jesus not judge anyone? No, he does. But his point is, is that I'm not personally judging with my own opinions that I formed from my own reasoning. It's the Father. That's where I got everything. And what he's really saying is, therefore, if I, as God the Son, get everything from the Father and I don't form my own ideas for my own reasoning, then you as fallen human beings better not do it. Or you'll end up in the camp of the devil, not my camp. It's very important to get this. The number one problem that we have in the American church today and in our church is that when you are taught something from scripture, rather than grappling with it with elders who know the word of God, who can actually lead you in that direction, you go off to other people when you don't like something and talk about it with them, or you just kind of talk about it to yourself so you don't actually grapple with any sort of shepherd that can lead you along the way in the word of God. You, according to your own reason, your own culture, your own traditions, and your own philosophies, end up rejecting the word of God without knowing it. When you hear things that you don't like, and I guarantee if you are a human being reading God's word, God, surprise, surprise, does not actually agree with you in, on everything. I know it's shocking that the eternal God may not actually have all your opinions and agree with all your practices, but believe it or not, he doesn't. And that's probably going to offend you when you read it, and you're probably not going to like it. Your flesh definitely doesn't like the restriction. It's going to look at it as law or something when God tries to rebuke you of sin. This is why. So the whole point then, I'm getting back to the point of why do they hate Jesus? Because he's bringing the word of God to them that does not agree with them and is telling them that they're wrong. And rather than repent because they're not regenerate, they hate Christ and they want to kill him. They want to get rid of him. My appeal to you is that when you hear the word of God spoken to you, grapple with it. If you're not sure if it's the word of God, great. Let's talk about it a lot. But let's talk about it from scripture. Not, I hate that. That's ridiculous. That's absurd. I've never heard such a thing. Uh, that's not what the way that I was, I was raised. That's not my tradition. That's not the way I think. I just think that. And I just think this. You are reasoning like a damned person. Do not do that. Now, if you want to go to scripture and like, well, what about this scripture here? I didn't really understand this here. How do you figure that? And you really want to reason through it. Great. That's what you should do because scripture is your authority. But if you walk away just because you don't like something that's said, and well, I don't agree with that. It's like, I don't care if you agree. I don't care if the scripture agrees with me. It's the scripture that has authority. I don't have any authority. If I speak something that's not scripture, then 
then yeah, ignore it, but make sure it's not scripture by having a good long chat first about it. Unfortunately for the American church is every man thinks, uh, you know, he does what's right in his own eyes and he actually thinks what's true in his own eyes and he doesn't, he doesn't think it's a big deal. And so he just goes his own way, thinks he can have his own opinion. And yet there's one light here, not many. There's one way to the truth here, not many. There's one truth of the Father, not many. And so it's very important to understand that if you disagree, someone's wrong. And it's only going to be through looking at the word of God and letting it really evaluate your ideas and your traditions and your cultures and your personal opinions and your reasoning that you'll come to the truth. But you're only going to do that, like we said last week, if you actually want to do the will of God. Yeah, Al. Uh, Let's see how I can put this. We as humans, we think because we think we have true knowledge. Yeah. But in the fall, knowledge was removed from you. And that knowledge is God's knowledge about himself, who he is, what he's doing, all those things. So that's being brought back to you, given back to you through the scripture, through what Brian's doing. So when you say to yourself, I don't believe this, it's because I'm smart or I have knowledge. You don't have that knowledge. That knowledge is outside of you, separate from you. Yeah, it's because you believe in the ancient saying, I think, therefore I am. Yeah, and a lot of people That's... don't realize when God says, ask God for wisdom and knowledge, he's saying that for a reason. Because you don't have the knowledge that you need. It's not in you. Yeah, we're, we're suffering from being Pelagians uh, as children of the Enlightenment. And we therefore think that our problem is, is that we just need... We just need knowledge added to what we have because we already have it. In reality, the knowledge you have of the world is actually the devil's knowledge. Um, and that's why you have such conflict when you hear the word of God. Because the devil's knowledge sometimes can coincide with God's knowledge in terms of, of uh, the, the truth, that it has some similarity. But then the way that it's perceived, the way that it's pushed is going to be off toward what's wicked and disobedient and all of that. Um, so ultimately, what do we need? We need to understand what is the norm in our lives that norms all other norms. You've heard that terminology before? So scripture is the norm, meaning it makes, it's the standard. It's the measuring stick by which we measure every other thing in the world that we measure things by. So it is supreme. That's what Sola Scriptura is. Sola Scriptura is not all knowledge is in Scripture. That's not the claim. The claim is that all knowledge must be judged by Scripture. It's the judge above everything else. And if you come up with something through philosophy, tradition, your own reasoning that is in conflict, guess who's wrong? You are. But the, the danger is, is that you're going to try to convince yourself that you're still in continuity with Scripture when you're not. That's why you need elders who actually know the scripture to help you through it. It's not mystical. We don't have some sort of mystical authority or something over scripture. We have to exegete it. And so it's a matter of like showing you, hey, here's where I got this. Um, look at your Bible. Here's where I got this. I'm not just pulling it out of the air. And you should, you should talk to your elders so you know that's what they're doing. Because a lot of elders are doing stuff like, yeah, no, just, you know, I feel like the spirit taught me it. It's like, wait a minute. That's not our authority. I have no way of knowing if the Spirit taught you it. Let's go to the Bible. Any comments, questions on that? Good. Everybody agrees. Uh, I expect no. <laughs> Everybody leaves like, I don't think I agree. I don't even know. I mean, <laughs> he only used one chapter. <laughs> Do you guys see how that's connected? I, I don't, because sometimes, like, I, I see how it's connected really easily. Some people don't necessarily see how it's connected. Um, but that's what's happening in the passage. Christ is saying, look, I've gotten this from the Father. That's the difference between what I'm saying and what you guys are saying. Yours is according to experience and the flesh. That's not what I'm doing. I actually came from the Father, and he makes a statement, I know where I ca I've come from. I actually am God. I've come from the Father. 
Uh, you don't know where I've come from. That's why you're all confused. You don't know what's true because you're too busy judging according to your own experience and reasoning. So you have no idea what the truth is. If you understood, you would actually admit that you're a sinner and that you don't know and you'd submit to me and you'd understand that I am from the Father and you'd receive me. But because you, you don't and you're off on your own ideas, your own opinions, because you don't really want to do the will of God, that's why you reject me, and that's why you're actually children of the devil, which, again, is next week. We haven't talked about that yet. So um, it seems like there could actually be two things happening here, from my opinion. I'm just kidding. Um, uh, it seems like you could see clearly that he's talking about the teaching that Christ is, that Christ is brought from the Father to bear upon uh, the, uh, the Jews. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it also seems like he's literally talking about Christ is going, God is going to judge them through Christ in his death. So like it's, you have the teaching that comes through Christ, and then you have the actual judgment of Christ himself being crucified by them, yeah. and, and God judging them that way through him. So it, it's kind of like twofold in this, in this um, passage, right? Yeah, no, I think what you're talking about when he says, like, uh, when you have lifted up the Son of yeah. Man, then you'll know that I am he. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that I do nothing on my own authority. Right. There's, there's actually kind of a double meaning there to where um, when you have lifted up, both obviously it's in view of the cross, but it's also the idea is that when someone has actually exalted Christ, they also will understand that he's come from the Father. It's kind of, so just, again, it depends on who you are. Are you the one crucifying Christ? Are you the one bowing down to him and receiving him? Um, He makes the statement, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Um, Notice then by saying you are truly my disciples, there is such a thing as what? Right, false disciples. So again, we are talking about in the church. It is so tempting to apply this to the world, but this is talking about the church. It's not just talking about evangelism and why someone receives the gospel and why someone doesn't. It's actually talking about Christians as to why some people receive the word of God as Christians and some people do not. That's really the application because that's what we're talking about here, the the covenant community. Uh, So if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What does that mean? Just like kind of into it what the truth is, and then I'm free. Like I can do whatever I want. <laughs> right, exactly. It's like the someone, thing. someone stone Jesse now, please. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the opening of the mind, though. The, mo- the mind is bound, and the the carnal mind is is um, it, it is unable to reason, to think, to illuminate, to do anything yeah. that produces life. And so Christ comes. He says, I forget where it is, but. He says, who has the mind of God, but you have the mind of Christ. That, that is the thing that has been set free, is that mind not only can now think, but the body can actually do the will of God. Yeah, if you um, <clears throat> think back to the, the beginning was, is that Christ says, I'm the light, right? What is the light again? You can see everything else with the light. If I don't accept what the word of God says about a particular thing that I'm doing is sin... Will I ever be free of that sin? It's impossible. Because I don't think it's it's sin, and I'm likely making the argument it's not sin because I still want to do it. I'll never be free of it. It's not saying if you know the truth, you immediately will no longer struggle with sin. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is, is that the first step that actually cuts those cords is you knowing the truth so that you realize, oh, that is sin, and my salvation away from that is the Son of God. It's the gospel. That's why the unbeliever only uses 10% of their brain and the believer uses 11%. Yeah, right, and now you can fly. Um, Yeah, no, so that's the idea, though. The truth will set you free. He goes on to say how, look, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And, And it's not just that you're a slave to sin in the sense that you struggle with it. You're a slave to sin because it's actually darkening your mind 
because it's making you not want to know the truth and to stay in the dark so you'll never know the truth. So it's not just something that is moral. It's actually affecting your theology. It's affecting like what you believe about the world. It's affecting what you believe about Jesus, what you believe about God and all of that. And of course, it's obviously going to affect what you believe about morality. And so it's affecting your mind. It's not just affecting your behavior. And yet Christ is saying, look, if you abide in my word, my word, and what does it, what does it do? The Spirit's going to take it and he's going to chip away at all that darkness. It's going to be light. He's going to give you the ability to see. And through that, he's going to be setting you free. Is yeah. He giving you the ability to see your sin? Yes. He's giving you the ability to see your sin. He's giving you the ability to see him for who he is, for the Father for who he is, what the, the road of salvation is, which is him. He is life itself. He is the source of life. He is what comes in and kills anything chaotic and, and deadly and dark in your life um, through and the truth. You, you yeah, and in others, in sure. Others too. Yeah. yeah. It, it's interesting how a lot of people uh, interpret that in a somewhat, if not very overtly antinomian fashion. The truth will set you free. In other words, free to sin, like right. free to do more yeah. than what I currently have. Like the law and the word binds me, and the truth, like a, whatever that existential knowledge is, is going to set me free to be able to do more beyond the boundaries of what God's word would seem to say. Right. But if you read like three verses down, right. it's in the context of free from sin, right? right? Not free to sin. Yeah. Um, and it actually will, um, like you said, the knowledge of what sin is will set you free from that sin. Right. And so, yeah. yeah, there's a like a, it's 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 a election day, so this is my little political plug. <laughs> uh, but I think that if and it's not conservative or liberal, but like biblically minded Christians now can see reality, um, and that is what God sets us free to do: is to actually see the world as it is. Uh, in relation to who God is, yeah. the godless want to be free from reality. Yeah. They want to live in the virtual world, or they want to create their own genders. They want to be, yeah. they want to be the gods that create on their own. They want to dwell in the darkness because it doesn't shine a light on what they're doing and right. their and activity. You can do whatever sort of origami you want in the darkness, or whatever sin, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, uh. I was going to say something off of that. Sorry. No, that's okay. It's like the Matrix. <laughs> there, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. I no, I was joking. <laughs> <laughs> I it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, except without the Gnosticism. Um, Still good, though. Here, here is a really important point for us. So all of you know that, what Brent just said. All of you know that. All of you have seen now things that you have not seen before, you understand things you've not understood before, here's the danger. You still have a sin nature, though. You have a new nature. You've been regenerated, but you have a sin nature. And it's going to try to fool you by saying, you know what? You're good where you are. You've, you've actually, you pretty much got that Christian, Christianity thing down. You're good. You can stop where you are. So that when now someone comes to you with a sin that you haven't heard about before or something, you'd be like, no, 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 I already know what Christianity is about. I don't need to really think about that. And you'll go back into the darkness that way. Be really careful. You are not glorified yet. You are still being sanctified. So what you've seen so far is part of your sanctification, not the whole of it. You need to keep on going. You need to keep receiving. You need to keep going back to the word of God and judging this and that and the other thing because you're not done yet. Don't assume that you are so that you just ignore or dismiss when people are making biblical arguments to you. Again, this is a, the problem of the American church. Um, yeah. I was just going to say my, one of my favorite verses there amongst the many, but... Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and test my thoughts and see if there be any gracious yeah. in me. And that's a man who's lived with God his whole life. He's worshipped God his entire life, and he's still like, I, I know there's probably stuff in me, God. Like, let's bring it out. Like, search me. Make it known to me um, so that I can just get rid of it. There's, it's, it's, just, it's more and more. Yeah. 
Is it be gracious in a self-biased kind of way when you're a baby Christian or a non-believer? Mm-hmm. Um, but then as you grow in Christian maturity um, and you hold yourself to a higher standard, it seems like it's harder and harder to be gracious towards people, mm-hmm. um, to be gracious mm-hmm. towards people that are that have the sins that you hold yourself accountable to not fall into and that sort of thing. Yeah. And it seems like we... Um, we give grace, or we call it grace when it's really licentiousness, to ourselves inappropriately. Right. Um, and then we don't give grace to others, and it seems like most ev- evangelical churches have it backwards, yeah. where they're way gracious towards themselves and yeah. licentious, and they're not gracious. Well, I have good reasons, though, and you don't. So... I know all my great reasons for why I'm not listening to God in those areas. And God's okay with it. I've talked to him. Um, But you, you you know, you're a hypocrite, though. But but not me. Yeah, I know. So this is the problem, again, of the church. Is that we, well, this is the problem of human nature. um, Is that we just, we are really super gracious toward ourselves and not other people. And, um... And unfortunately, like in reality, like you, again, like you said, it should be backwards, right? Like I should be really harsh on myself and gracious toward others. But it's a self-defense mechanism because if I judge you for that sin, I'm righteous. So if I'm still sinning, well, yeah, I'm struggling with sin, but I'm righteous because I hate that sin in you. And again, it's just this sort of really tricksy thing that we do to make ourselves out to be good and justify that it's okay that we remain as we are because we're still good people. Because, you know, I'm pointing out sins in you. This is the problem with the church being like, oh, isn't the world horrible with, you know, transgenderism and abortion and all that stuff? The world's just bad. And it's like, well, yeah, and, you know, and the church is supposed to be the light that's shining and it's got all the garbage in it as well. Let's actually work on that. Paul even makes a statement like, I don't judge the world, but if you're in the community of God, yeah, now now I'm going to judge you. Um, that's really the sphere that we should be focusing on, not, not others. Or you get churches that will always crit- critique other churches, but not their own. If you notice today, it got real awkward when I was like, hey, here's your problem. <laughs> About, you know, hey, you need to come to your elders and be guided by the scripture and everything. Because I'm talking to you. Why would I be talking about some other church? Yeah, to be instructive maybe, but ultimately it's you. This word is for you. It's for you to actually be convicted. It's for you to think about it. Not just other people. Other people aren't here right now. You're here. And so God has this for you. And so I need to speak directly to you, not about other people or something. So anyway, yeah, that's, that's the way we avoid actually dealing with our own issues to but still seem righteous because we're still condemning them and others. It's the crux of the argument of what you're talking about. That's why I wanted yeah. to highlight it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Anything else? No. So when he says, <laughs> if you abide in my word, mm-hmm. you're um, basically how we can, is this right how to read this? If you are in my word, and keep my word, then you're really my disciples. You're really born again. You're re- yeah. you're the regenerate. Yeah. And you will know the truth about your sin, and you will learn the truth about your sin, and the truth will set you free. Not now, just be repenting of that sin because yes. you see it as sin. Right. right. Where before you don't see it as sin. Right. Not not only of the sin though. It what will cause you to repent is you'll see it as sin, and you'll then you'll see. The, the desirability of the, of the Son of God and the Father and the fellowship with Him. And you, it'll shine a light to realize that life is not in the sin that you thought it was. It's not in that, that vice that you have. It's not in that relationship that you have. It's not in the money that you have. It's not in any of that stuff that you thought it was. It's actually in fellowship with the Son and the Father who made you. Uh, through the Holy Spirit. In other words, the triune God is our salvation and our life, not all this other stuff. And that's the truth that will come open. If you, by the way, abide in his word. What does it mean to abide? Almost there. It's to remain. 
So if you're going to start in the word of God, but then you go off on your opinion and you go off on your reasoning and you go off on your tradition and you go off into Neoplatonism and Aristotelianism and blah, 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 then you are not his true disciples. Because later what he's going to say is, my sheep hear my voice and the voice of another they will not listen to. So it's very important. It's like irresistible grace. Uh, in the beginning, right? So, like, the, the, the veil falls, the hatred for our sin uh, that destroys us is known, and, and we hate our sin. We, we put on Christ, we put on, we have the new mind, and then as we grow and mature as a Christian, we continue to go back to the Word and, and do that all right. over again and right. again. Yeah. yeah. What, why are we doing communion every week? Because it's a reminder that you go back to the beginning because you're always needing to be renewed and cleansed because you're not done yet. That's depths and levels. Right. That's what you have to be very careful with. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a continual cleansing. I mean, you know, it's, it's, you are making progress, but it's, frankly, progress is going to look like uh, you're, you're actually not making progress because <laughs> the more you progress, the more you're going to see the holiness of the Lord and the more you're going to see your sin and you're actually going to feel worse uh, by the time you get done than you were in the beginning. Because <laughs> he's the light. Right. And he's showing you the difference, darkness, right. and the light. Yeah. And the closer you are, the, the worst thing that I have seen are Christians who think that they're good or they're reaching the end. That tells me you don't have a good relationship with God. If the closer you are to God, the more that light shines, the more you will see who you are and the more you need to be changed. And the more submissive you will be then to the word of God, the more open you will be when you hear things that are contrary because you're like, yeah, I probably am wrong in that area. I probably do need to think about it. But the more self-righteous you are and the more, think, the more you think you're done, you're going to be like, yeah, no, I got it. That's one of the things that Israelites actually say when they're with Moses, when they rebel, they're like, ah, you know what, Moses, look, the people are holy enough now. Saying this of a people who have rebelled against God, who's God, God's like, I am not going to let you in the land. You are so wicked with your idolatry and immorality and everything. That's God's assessment of the people. But the assessment of themselves is, oh, no, we're holy enough now. We're good. Never be in that. If you are close to God, going closer and closer and understanding who he is, understanding his holiness, abiding in his word so that you can understand that, you're going to see more and you're going to see more of your sin. Don't be discouraged that you see more of your sin. I would be discouraged if you start dismissing and think that you're good. Be discouraged about that. But if you see more and more of your sin, it's like, well, you're actually on the right path. That's, that's where, what you should be. So when you sin and you're, and afterwards you're just so ashamed and you beat yourself up, that's actually a good thing because yeah. God's exposing your sin. Yeah. You, you feel the weight of it. You repent. You're disgusted by it. Yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah, I got news for you. It, as you mature in Christianity, you will eventually get to the point where while you're sinning, you will hate it. And to get to the point to where you actually hate it so much that before you sin, you will hate it. And then not sin. That's the, that's the progression? <laughs> well, I, I'm just saying, you, you, again, you, you get closer and closer to God to where you can't even enjoy sin anymore. Even when you do decide to sin, it's no longer a full enjoyment because you're just sort of like, I hate this. I don't want to do this. Again, I, I feel... Yeah, it's just, you, you just, you're totally disgusted by it. And then eventually you're just like, nah, I'm not going to do this. Yes, sir. When the Bible talks about conscience, if you have no conscience, you're in big trouble. Yeah. So remember that. If you think, if you don't think about your sin, it's better to have a really terrible conscience than it is to have no conscience. Yeah, the worst place, I mean, you know, you get some of these antinomians who are like, I, I'm just freeing Jesus, so, you know, you guys are legalistic, I don't care about sin, blah, 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 and it's like, uh, you don't know God, dude. You don't know God. You're so far away, you think you're the closest because you understand grace, but actually you're not. You're a million miles away. Yeah. It's one of my favorite prayers is 
asking God to resensitize my conscience. Mm. Yeah. That's a great one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very good. When you see a church with a fire on the front, you know, Kim Rilbar used to say, fire bad, hot, fire hot. You know, you, when you get closer and closer to God, it gets hotter and hotter, not, yeah. not, not cooler. Yeah. Can you think of the Lutheran symbol? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. The fire, what do you mean? Haven't you ever seen a Pentecostal a church where they yeah, have a Pentecostal? Yeah, Pentecostal. They, they, oh, okay. On the yeah, front of the building, they'll have a big like fire. fire. We're talking about? <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll actually put up, fire back. Instead of a cross, they'll put up fire. Is this a cross? Yeah, fire in the south? Or, yeah. uh, <laughs> where was this yeah. out? <laughs> actually, I think there's one right down the street. <laughs> Maybe you better open your eyes when you're driving. Yeah, apparently. Look for a burning church. All right. Hey, any uh, any other comments, questions? Yeah, Jesse. Uh, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on the concept, or the, maybe two on the surface competing concepts between the scripture as the norming norm mm -hmm. and uh, abiding in the word, uh, dwelling, staying. Right. So yeah. the one concept, the norming norm, would say. Um, the scripture is, is above everything else, right? So we're going to go study, um, you know, mathematics, science, history, right. philosophy, tradition, astronomy, like whatever it is, right. scripture is going to norm all of that. Right. And then, you know, maybe just like the, the, the straw man on the other side would be like, don't look at any of that stuff. Right. And maybe they would, they would say like, okay, you can look at like math. But like, don't look at philosophy because you need to stay well in the word. Don't leave the word to go look at those things. Yeah. Um, versus the word norming those norms. How do you balance, or how do you, can you just talk? Open. Well, I, I wouldn't balance them. I th I think I think that what you said in terms of it, you can go ahead and study mathematics because the word is judge over those things. Here's the danger, and I've seen this a thousand times over. Um, someone picks up a philosophy that in certain elements can be seen as consistent with scripture. But then because of that, they go into that philosophy and the philosophy ends up becoming the norm over scripture and reinterpreting scripture so that you end up with stuff like transubstantiation because you adopted not just certain things of Aristotelian thought, but Aristotelian thought as the way to see through as the grid, even scripture itself. Now your norm is Aristotelian philosophy, not the scripture. And that's what happened with the Roman Catholic Church. Same thing with Neoplatonism with the Eastern Church. Um, there are things that sound similar that can be consistent with scripture, but pretty soon it became the norm through which the grid, through which scripture was read. And at that point, now Neoplatonism is the norm that norms all norms, including scripture. That's the danger. Ironically, too, right? Aristotle was interpreted through Islam, through the North Africans, and then up into Europe, and then they got it. Then, then uh, Catholicism got Aristotle thought from the Muslims, right? Because they said, yeah, they're, they're actually they preserve a lot of, I think, uh, Aristotle and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah and Spain. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, no, I, I think um, abiding in the Word means you remain. It, it's it's your it's your compass always. And you don't let those things take over. You can evaluate everything. You can say, hey, that's consistent. You can pursue any knowledge you want, but it needs to be under that. And you need to be really careful because the devil always is looking to replace the scripture with something else. And he'll do it very subtly and you won't even know it until it's too late. Does it with work, right? So like um, I had this example uh, where I thought, man, I really need to abide in the word. I have a check ride coming up and I'm flying and I'm reading and I'm doing all this stuff and where my body is like, you need to be reading this stuff, I, I, uh, I would read the word. And honestly, I did better than I've ever done uh, just in the performance because I was actually dwelling in the word. Yeah. So other things made more sense yeah. because it was like the, the word was the center of everything. Yeah, I look here's yeah, I mean there's uh, here's an example from my early days in uh, college, right? So I um I used to fail everything. I used to just cuz I hated studying, I hated all that sort of thing. And um I, I and then I became a Christian and I was in I think a psychology class and a sociology class secular. It gave me the scripture gave me like something to judge everything with to where I as opposed to even the professor in the class had some sort of measuring stick 
to look at what we were reading and be critical toward it. And we gave like presentations or whatnot. I aced those courses because of that. Um, because he was amazed. I was able to actually now like evaluate. Most students are just reading it and just sucking it in and no one can really be critical of it. Um, it really is a light uh, that gives you the ability to say, that's good. That, where does that come from? That's not good. And you're doing that not because of your opinion and own reasoning. You're doing it from the scripture. The scripture gives you that. Which is why it's so important to know it and which is why it's so important to be under people who know it and be guided by people who know it. And so, again, as I've always said, I think sola scriptura means you have a high view of church. Um, because you understand the church is the interpreter of the scripture. Not in a mystical way, but because these men are qualified to teach from their study. Yes? Um, uh, uh, sin makes you like Gollum. Yes. Thank you for the Lord of the Rings analogy, by the way. You, A for the day. Yeah. In that light, so that exactly sets us free yeah. Yeah, to see sin in its true nature. Yeah. yeah, and then we realize that that exactly was what we were meant for. Yeah, yeah. and that liberates us. Obviously, there's a struggle between our flesh and our uh, spirit that's happening with us because we are getting renewed every yeah. day because we are in the light. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, like uh, the first verse of uh, John 8 12 says, I am the light. And John 1, uh, 1, 1 John also right. opens with that God is light and in Him is right. no darkness. And if you have fellowship in Him, then uh, you have the blood of the Son, you know, who's going to cleanse you right. Right, once again. Because in the light, you'll know the sin of your own self. Yeah. What is all the light terminology taken from, by the way? It, from the Old Testament. Where in the Old Testament? Well, I mean, from the, like, so he's saying that based on, it's all the light terminology in John is coming from a place in the Old Testament. Is it going to be the burning bush? Is it going to nope. be the pillar of fire? No. Nope. Be... Yes, Genesis 1. Oh, the beginning was... What does light do? The whole, the whole world is in chaos, and then boom, let there be light, and now life and creation. That's what Jesus is. That's what the truth that he brings us to, from the Father is. It creates us. We are, go we are golems. Um, by the way, golem looks like a, if you were to actually, I, I realize in the movie there's like light in the cave, but if you were actually to be in the cave, it's pretty dark. Golem would look pretty much like a human and probably, you probably wouldn't see him as much uh, different than what he was before he like fell and all that. You get him in the light and you're like, ugh. Uh, you can tell he doesn't look very human at all. He looks very malformed, which is what, you know, golem means. Um, or unformed, let's say, put it that way. But that's what light does. It, it creates out of chaos and makes things that are dark and chaotic and not uh, filled with life, it causes them to be filled with life and order and all of that. So, yeah. We are, the, we are the finality of God's creation in that way. And he does it the same way he did before. And that's why Christ is called the word in John. Because it's through word that he brings about all of this. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, some, some people even translate new creation, right? All right, anything else? I'm just going to stare at you until someone has a question. Now, all right, let's go ahead and bow in a word of prayer. Jess, do you want to pray for us? Oh, all right, go ahead. I, that I don't know. I don't know. I never. I actually. I. I didn't even think about that. Um, yeah. I don't know. I'd have to think about how that. Yeah. Maybe it connects in some way. I'm not sure. I mean, it could be that they're just literally in the treasury. But I mean, again, again, like I feel like you know, especially in John, he brings out the providence of God quite a bit. I don't know if that would just be a coincidence. It's gotta. It's gotta probably connect to something. Yeah. I'd have to think about that more though. Yeah. Jesse, you want to pray for us? Yeah. Lord, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to study it. We thank you for teachers that can bring it to us and to shine lights into our lives. Please help us to see ourselves uh, first uh, and enliven our conscience.
differences, help you see ourselves for who we are, um, so that we can be free from sin. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys.